thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Um, and thank you for uh, Maria, that was a fantastic talk. Um, today, uh, so my name is Daniel Ball. I'm a, a PhD student at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London. And today I'm gonna to be talking about modeling circadian rhythms in the blind. Um, oh. Okay, um, yeah, I'm, I've broken today's talk up into two short sections. I'll briefly talk about the circadian pacemaker and the influence of light. And uh, I'll talk about what happens to the pacemaker when this signal is disrupted through blindness. Um, I'll talk about particular blind populations uh, of interest to me and um, the data collection that I'm doing at the moment, um, which is remote and in the field. In the second section, I'll talk briefly about some of the modeling stuff I'm doing, um, Gauss and Mixture models with Hidden Markov models. Um, very briefly, I'll talk about that. And then I'll go on to talk about modeling activity in blind people, the influence of a circadian oscillator that we've built into the model. And uh, finally, I'll briefly talk about um, electroencephalogram and activity together, just really as a way to stimulate some questions and some interesting stuff that have popped up in the model recently. Um, it's worth noting that this is still ongoing research and, and I'm not going to make any robust conclusions today, but really just talk through the processes that I'm working on. Um, okay, so uh, Maria's already spoken today about that the master pacemaker in the brain uh, located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus regulates circadian rhythms in humans. And um, interestingly, the, the pacemaker will have an endogenous phase slightly longer than the light dark cycle of the earth. So it requires timing cues in humans predominantly light to, to make sure that, that a person stays aligned with the light dark cycle. In uh, mammals, this is exclusive to the retina and a very particular class of cells called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that uh, encode changes in ambient light, um, which are most responsive to blue wavelengths of light that are most abundant in the middle of the day. <clears throat> um, so some of the strongest evidence that comes for light as a predominant timing cue in humans comes from the blind. Um, Typically, or commonly, you, you might find in a blind person with no um, light perception that they will have a, a drift in circadian rhythm. And for a person that has a 25 hour circadian rhythm, every two weeks, they will be completely orthogonal to the light dark cycle of the planet. And it means that they have heightened wakefulness at night and are drowsy during the day. Although this is typical, in some cases, this is not found. Uh, uh, and uh, Professor Clareman showed this actually in her work, who was talking this afternoon. Um, and part of the explanation might come from the different types of blindness and different eye diseases and what it, what it actually selectively does to the retina. And this is what I'm interested in. Um, so on this slide, this shows um, cross sections of the retina taken with ocular coherence tomography as an imaging technique. Um, on the top panel is from a, from a healthy retina. You can see the nice two uh, thick, healthy layers of the retina. Uh, the middle, there's a, there's a dip. That's the optic disc where the optic nerve meets the uh, retina. On the top layer is where the rods and cones are found for the image forming layers. And on the bottom layer is the ganglion cell layer where the intrinsic photosensitive retinal ganglion cells are found. On the second panel down, you can see uh, uh, from a patient with glaucoma and there's selective atrophy on the ganglion cell layer. So um, people have suggested, and it's been, been partially shown that, that in people with glaucoma, this affects the circadian pathway from the retina and, and thus affects circadian rhythms. And in the bottom panel, this is from a person with retinitis pigmentosa. And in RP, which is one of the most common uh, inherited retinopathies, there's damage to the rods and cones, but leaves the ganglion cell layer relatively unharmed until late stages of the disease when you may get some pain of the optic disc and atrophy in the optic nerve. Um, so the, these are the, really the, the um, two uh, patient groups that I'm looking at. Um, we don't have this data yet, but with our collaborators at Moorfields, we will eventually um, get this, this data and we will get some um, idea of the population of the IP RGC in our, in our um, participants. Um, so in the last, um, last months, I've been recording data in the field remotely. I've been using this Hypnodyne EEG headset, um, which we give to the participants and they take it away and it allows them to sleep naturally in their own bed. And we, we don't um, interfere with their, with their um, sleep and waking times and, and such things. We, we ask them to record for a minimum of seven nights. And we also give them an Acti watch um, and send them off with this for a week to measure their activity and rest cycles. And um, we're also recording um, sleep diaries and other questionnaires, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. 
Um, all of the data that's collected with these devices will be um, spoken about in the next section, in the modeling sections. Okay, so in section two, I'll briefly touch on the mixture models with the hidden Markov models and then modeling activity, the circadian oscillator and um, an electroencephalogram and activity put together in our blind participants. So, uh, Gaussian to mixture models with hidden Markov models, in essence, for any distribution, there may be subsets of Gaussian distributions defined by their mean and standard deviation that better describe the variance. And then the hidden Markov component is that um, there may be uh, underpinning these, these distributions or combinations of these distributions, there may be hidden or discrete states that can't be observed directly, but we make inferences on these states based on the, on the observables. <clears throat> In our case, this is uh, for the next section, this is activity data. Um, so, so why HMM? So, so this is um, quite an interesting theoretical point. It, it, there's, um, we don't need large data sets to train our models because uh, in the real world, especially with clinical populations, there's large idiosyncrasies in, in the damage to their eyes, the age of onsets of their blindness, and all these types of factors that can affect, um, affect a person's circadian rhythm. So we don't need large training sets. We can run the model on, on each participant and look at uh, different characteristics of their sleep and rhythm uh, activity cycles. Um, we have um, comprehensible par um, parameters so we can really look at, uh, we get estimations of, of each of the variables and, and the input and um, we can put external uh, predictors into the model. And so some of the questions we can ask with these models is what's the probability of observing a particular sequence of rest and wake activity? We can ask, um, given somebody's asleep, what's the probability that they will wake up at any particular point? And we can also ask about what's the influence of external factors such as um, a circadian oscillator, which I'm gonna talk about in a, in a moment. Okay, so for modeling the activity, um, we're using a, a free state model. Um, so in a state of rest, um, so a moderately active and highly active states, and we assume that at the input, the activity are made up of um, Gaussian distributions are defined by their mean and standard deviation. Um, and uh, in our model, we've included a somewhat of a circadian oscillator. So we, we assume that there will be some influence from this circadian pacemaker that will be approximately 24 hours. And um, we don't have a proper parametric estimate of the oscillator at the moment, but it's something we're working towards. But at the moment, I've tried different um, timed oscillators to so 24 hours up until um, 25, 26 hours and see which is the best model fit. Um, just some acknowledgements for the next sections. Um, I'm using, I've used a package called DeepMix S4, which was um, written by my uh, co-supervisor, Martin Speckenbrink, um, at UCL. It's really accessible, written in our language, if people are interested in using these models. And um, I've adapted some code that was used by, um, by a team at Warwick University, and the reference is the bottom there. Um, but I can pass it on if anybody's interested. Okay, so to begin, I'm, I've used a, um, this is from a normally sighted person, <clears throat> just to kind of explain the model. On the top panel is um, raw accelerometer activity that's been averaged over a five minute period um, with the states that superimposed on the top. On the second panel, um, you can see the probability of being in any state across a week. Uh, the blue, the blue um, lines are representative of the state of rest. And then the pink lines are um, moderately, moderately active, and then the red lines are highly active. And you can kind of see from the from this um, second panel that there's a, a nice periodic um, sleep and rest cycle. In the bottom panel is a particular day of any person's rest and wake activity across a 24 hour period. And you can see for this person um, that during a period of rest, in the middle of their rest period, it's highly probable that they will stay in rest and they won't move into a, a period of activity, um, which is basically waking up. Um, so next we'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> um, some blind people. So this first person is, um, this is a person with, with retinitis pigmentosa that has some light perception. Um, the best model fit was a 24 hour um, circadian oscillator, a predictor for the model. Um, and as we kind of suggested in, when we was looking at the cross sections of the retina, they have, a relatively periodic circadian um, rhythm and activity cycle. 
um, although they, they seem to be asleep a lot. But in, um, in the bottom panel, we can see that while they're in, their, in the middle of their rest um, state, the chances of them moving into a, a state of activity or waking up is quite low. So that's what we might expect to somebody that has damage to their eyes, but doesn't have damage to the uh, retinal ganglion cells that are uh, the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Um, the next panel, this is a, a somebody with late stage retinitis pigmentosa, and they're starting to get some disruption to their circadian rhythm based on our model. Um, the best model fit, what, what I found for this person was a 24.1 hour model. And this is what might be expected that, that um, they have very reduced light perception, but also there could be damage to the, um, to the optic disc and the optic nerve. And you, at the late stages of disease, you start to get this drift into the rhythm. And this is what we found in this participant. Um, next, so this is, this is now we're looking at people with glaucoma that have damage to this um, layer of the retina that houses these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And this is what you find this person has childhood glaucoma has really hardly any light perception at all. And the best model fit that we could find was with a circadian oscillator that, that is um, oscillating at 24.5 hours. So they have a drift in circadian rhythm. We can see on the second panel that for the first few days, they hardly have any rest state at all. And then they kind of um, have this sort of real collapse where they have long periods of rest. And the bottom panel again shows that during any day of, of their rest, they have a high probability of moving into, a, into a, an active state, so waking up. Um, and finally, we have, um, this is from uh, somebody with adult glaucoma with, they have no light perception. Um, but interesting to me is that they have a 24-hour um, a uh, oscillator, or that's the best model fit. And uh, going back to Maria's work, maybe this, this could be either a non-photic cue that's, that's, um, that's keeping them aligned to uh, a 24 hour rhythm, or they could have a, uh, an internal oscillator that the endogenous period is really close to 24 hours. But interestingly, you can see on the bottom panel that during the day, the probability of them being in a rest state actually goes down and they tend to sleep uh, during the day and are awake at night, um, which we would expect based on the damage to their retina. Okay, so I'm going to talk really briefly about um, electroencephalogram and building this into our model. Um, this is still really in early process, like really early days, but um, I'm just interested in some of the questions that this will raise and because of the, the uh, expertise on the panel, we might, we might come up with some, some interesting discussion points. Okay, so normally uh, when we record uh, EEG, we base uh, the stage on sleep on fluctuations in uh, frequency and amplitude in the electrical signal recorded from the scalp, which is then categorized into the four stages of sleep. Um, at the bottom is just a hypnogram that is a way of, um, of visualizing these stages of sleep across the night period. Um, so what we've done, uh, we've, we've started to build models up <clears throat> of the uh, rest and activity cycles and the EEG together to try and get a more holistic understanding about how the uh, brain activity is fluctuating during the night and how the influence of rest and activity is affecting these uh, brain these brain activity stages and the influence of uh, the circadian oscillator. Um, interestingly, we've not really found a particular stage of sleep for each participant yet, but this is there, there might be interesting reasons for that. Um, in with regards to this model, I've used uh, 30 second averages of rest and activity data and 30 second averages of um, the EEG data. Um, and the same assumptions apply that the, that the um, distributions are Gaussian. Um, so yeah, for our model, we, we, I did a power spectrum analysis and broke, them down in, broke the EEG signal down into frequency bands and looked at the power across a 30 uh, second epoch. And uh, that's what we used in our model. Okay, so this is um, from somebody with RP. Um, we can see there's um, a nice periodic rhythm to their, uh, to their um, brain activity and their rest and activity cycles together. Um, and this is, quite, this is an eight stage model. We're starting to pick up stages of sleep um, that are affected by their um, rest and activity cycles. Um, but interesting to me, in, the, uh, in a person with adult glaucoma, we're starting to pick up more um, discrete states. And this might be something whereby there are subsets of states of sleep that go across uh, longer periods of time, 
or interesting to me that maybe people might want to comment on later is that um, there seems to be some dissynchrony between the cortices, um, between the hemispheres um, on these stages of sleep. And on the bottom panel, this is, um, this is a slow wave sleep. And there's, um, there, there's, there's some asynchrony between the left and right hemisphere. So one of the things I'm interested in is what's the damage to each eye? Um, because people will have different populations of IPRGCs in each eye. How does this affect the clock? And in turn, how does this affect the stages of sleep? and um, the, the synchronous stage of sleep. So we're really looking, this is really early days, but we're looking at building up an idea of um, the stages of sleep and rest and activity over long cycles that possibly wasn't available to um, analysis by the human eye previously, but using our uh, unsupervised machine learning techniques, we can start to find um, nuances and hidden states and stuff in the EEG data that might not have been um, available before. Okay, so thank you. That, that's my talk. Um, thank you for listening and uh, open up for questions now or during the panel discussion. Excellent. Thank you, Danny. Uh, very, very exciting to, to hear uh, you talk about your work. Um, we do have a little bit of time uh, for questions, um, and we did get a few questions, so I will ask them now. And then, of course, you know, we'll have some maybe broader discussions as well during the Q&A, the, the panel discussion. Um, we have one question from Yazaya uh, Ting, um, who's saying, very interesting observations between the rest and active states for different conditions. I was wondering whether you could see any other rhythms, for example, ultradian uh, in the activity or behaviors when light perception is affected. Yeah, so um, we do, on the ACTI watches, there is a light sensor on there. Um, the light data has been intermittent, so I've not, I've not included that in the model today, but it, crudely, I've asked the participants to make sure that they keep the watch out when they wake up in the morning and try to get light in there. The, the models that we use do deal with hidden, um, with missing data quite well, but this is something that um, that we're looking at in the future. I've not, I've not actually looked at that yet, but, but I assume that if there is an effect of light on the rest of the activity cycles and that difference between different eye diseases, then you will see, hopefully you'll see differences in the effect. And I guess just to just to get to the core of the questions, do you see rhythms at other scales? So do you see something that's much shorter, you know, 12 hour scale or much longer uh, in the activity? Is that something you've looked at? No, no, we haven't. I haven't looked at that yet. But what what my plan is to, to hopefully see is that there's rhythms across a week in rest and activity cycles and within the EEG. So um, people people have been eyeballing the EEG data for for a century and now we have the computing techniques to look right across multiple nights and look for some um periodic patterns in there and hopefully there will be some i don't i haven't looked at that yet but this is really early stages excellent i mean i think probably lots of, lots of interesting analysis that you can do with these patients and with the data you're collecting there yeah, so I'm sorry. we'll be um we'll be we'll be curious to see where that goes and um, i have one question uh, or kind of two questions um from our questions from two people that are very much similar concerning the distribution. So uh, Beth Clerman says the distribution of activity values is not Gaussian. It's closer to a zero inflated Poisson. How does that affect the model? Um, and I think Greg Ahmad uh, in the Q&A asked a similar question. Um, is there any work to motivate and maybe learn from the estimated type of distributions uh, used to model the activity counts? Uh, how far from being normally distributed is it during rest and sleep? Yeah, so um, currently I've only I've based it on the assumption that they are Gaussian and I've not I've not looked at other distributions. Um, if that's something that so my co-supervisor Martin we brought up in a meeting recently is that it's not necessarily Gaussian, but we're going to this is something that we're going to look at. But for the purpose of today's talk, for simplicity, we I assume that they are Gaussian uh, normally distributed. Um, but that is, some, that is something that's that's a point that's been raised in our in our meetings. That's something we'll look at in the future. Yeah. I mean, I guess it seems like the Gaussian assumption is probably a good start, and then when it falls falls apart, you can see okay, how how should this be modeled really uh, to to account for the distributions? Um, just to follow up on another question from from Greg, um, how did you decide on the number of nodes uh, in the model needed to describe the data? Um, for which for which on the activity data? Yeah, I think this is specifically on the rest activity data. Yeah, so so there, there's some um, there's some argument I think on the, the amount of um, the amount of states best describe somebody's uh, activity and rest rhythms. 
But um, for the purpose of simplicity, again, for this talk, I just I just settled on three states that was, one was um, described in, in the paper that I, that I cited from Warwick University. And it just seemed to be negligible using diff more states for the, for the participants. So rather than going to saying, I mean, it's, um, if you give the model six states, it will shoot all the data into six states, but it, three states seems to be sufficient to describe what people are doing, basically. Excellent. I suppose this is also a, a, an empirical question, right? So seeing how many states do you need to, to account for this? And do you gain any anything if you add more states? Right? Yeah, so, so with regards to the EEG and the activity, we've, we've been playing around with lots of different states and it hasn't um, converged on any, it doesn't seem at the moment that there's a convergence on any particular number, but we don't really have the numbers to, to say that for certain at the moment. So we're still, you know, we're still seeing and um, playing around with the data and the EEG stuff, we really started doing it a couple of weeks ago. So it's really quite new. Um, I, I, the reason I included it today was just because of the expertise of the people that would be it. I just thought it's a good opportunity to show what I'm doing, but also for people's expertise to, to give their input. So that I think is a, the purpose of a workshop. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. No one's asking, no one's, you know, the question, the reason why we're asking questions is not to, not to, you know, uh, say, oh, you should have done this, but really to, to learn more about the work. Fascinating. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, I'm really grateful for it. So it's great. Good. Um, so thanks, Danny, for this really great talk. I think it's really fascinating uh, stuff. And I think gives us a window into understanding uh, the effects of the, of the, or the non-visual effects of light through this uh, patient, uh, uh, you know, patient view. Uh, so again, thanks, Danny.